In this session we look at cluster analysis and how to implement this with the software R. So as you may be used to now, we first set the working directory and then we load some data. This is data from governmental monitoring. The data has been modified because we don't have the rights to publish that on the web, but it's it serves the purpose for us as a demonstration data set. So we have a quick look at the data set. So the data set contains invertebrate species data that have been monitored along the river Vera. And why is this interesting? Because at some point between so they have several sampling sites along this river and at some point there's a discharge from a company and this company discharges saline water into the Vera. So there's an issue in salinization and you expect to see differences between the upstream from the discharge point and downstream communities. Have a look and at the environmental variables here we only have the site characteristics and the position and this can later be used for external validation in the clustering data set. We have discussed in the context of ordination and other methods before that if we are looking at variance reduction or and minimizing variance of clusters and have several variables then they should be on the same scale Otherwise, we have domination of some of the descriptors of the data set, in this case species, that will would dominate the whole data set. So as you may be used to from the previous script on RDA and PCA, we first for species data, we scale this and this is done here by later on by first we we will we will look at the we scale below here uh, using the square root transformation and we also look at how species how often they occur in the data set and this is done by presence absence transformation where we build the sum of the species to remove the rarest taxa so this is the identical code from a previous script. I don't explain that in detail. And we sort the data and we see that we have a total of 11 sites and some species in the data set never occur. So they are leftovers from a larger data set. These are just empty columns. And we have a couple of taxa that only occur in one of the sites. Now when we look at similarities between sites and we have species that just occur in one of the sites then obviously these species will not indicate any similarity and even with, with uh, two or three sites that would be not very high similarity with most of the sites or not be uh, species that help in finding grouping structures. Nevertheless we just remove the, the organisms here that occur at less than three sites or at two or three sites. So how is this done? We take the from the species data set we take the, we, we remove the first column first because the first column is the site descriptor. Which site do we? we look at and then we remove the comments that have columns that have a sum smaller total sum smaller than three so where species occur less than than two times or less now we look at the range of the abundances of the species in these sites and we find that the range of the taxa is from 16 to 15,000 so there's a really big difference in the abundances of the species in these sites so we 
square root transform first and have a look at the range afterwards. So this is done. Just to explain you briefly, the apply command uses the data that is given provided, the data set that is provided here with one or two you indicate whether you want to run a function on the rows or the columns of this data set and then you provide the function that, that is run. So here you take, you calculate the maximum for each of the columns and the range then selects the highest and the lowest value and again we see it's now between 4 and 120, 28 or 120 and with 120 and 4 well we still have like a factor of 25 difference so we could even double square root transform and then we have the range that is within approximately one order of magnitude. So we keep, we decide here to have a strong down weighting of the abundant taxa. Again, this would depend on the scope of your, on the scope of your research. And we transform the data into a new and assign it to a new object. Now for cluster analysis we need to determine the distances and for species data we have already discussed that Euclidean distance is typically not very appropriate. In this case be aware the vectors function of the vegan package uses the Bray Curtis distance that we use here for abundance data by default, whereas the dist function that is available in R uses the Euclidean distance by default. So we calculate the distance matrix. And then we can do the first clustering that we do is the hierarchical agglomerated clustering. If you if you compare to lecture, that's also the method that we started with and you may remember that there are different methods that you can use. So you here we use the average link method. There are other methods available that you are supposed to apply in the exercise as well and um, they are shown, this is shown below in the exercise, the other methods and you should know them from the lecture. So we have the average distance here and we calculate the, we use Ward's, Ward's method that basically minimizes the sum of squares within the, within the, cluster, within the cluster, so it's a sum of square-based method. We've discussed this in the lecture already. Now, when we have done calculation of some distance matrix from clustering, then afterwards or after the clustering the, all the objects will also have a distance and what this distance is is provided in the matrix after clustering and we can take this matrix and compare it to the distance matrix before clustering. So this can help us to evaluate or answer the question well does our clustering algorithm preserve or how good does it preserve the initial distances that we had between the objects how they are how are they later represented in the clustering solution and remember that our that our method is um, actually um, that the method that we use average linkage is a decision how you calculate the the distances between two clusters or between clusters and objects. The distance matrix is provided, so here we have first the distance matrix, the initial distance matrix that's based on the pre curtis distance and then we have the cofinetic matrix provided here. That is the matrix after clustering and we can simply calculate now the correlation between the two matrices and we see that we have a correlation of 0 0.79, so 0.8 almost. That's a relatively high correlation. If we compare this to the correlation 
For the Ward's method, we see that the correlation is lower. We could also calculate the stress value. Remember that we defined stress in the context of NMDS. So it's used to, to sum up the distances between the initial dis between the initial matrix and the resulting matrix. I'm dividing this by the sum of squares. So and remember that uh, for the NMDS we had some, some guidance on how to interpret the representation in the resulting matrix, from the NMDS matrix. We said if the stress value is below 0.1, then the representation is fairly good. Well, in this case, we have for the average linkage, we have a, we have a stress value of 0.16 which is still acceptable, whereas for the average, for the, for the Watts method, we have, we have um, 0.67, so very high. That's not a very good representation of the initial data. Now, keep in mind that in clustering, we, are not, we may not be aiming of representing our, our data in the most appropriate way uh, to most represent. We, wouldn't, we may not aim to represent the data in the uh, most appropriate way or keep, keep the same structure. We may want to find groups or we may want to find outliers and therefore distort the data. For example, build clusters that uh, space contracting or space dilating. We have discussed this in the lecture. So it's not necessarily indication that you shouldn't use this clustering method here because our aim may not be to represent, to have a representative and to have a good representation of the initial data set because we have a different aim. So just use them if you want to know or if your aim is to have a good representation of the initial data. We can now plot both resulting dendrograms. We have discussed briefly dendrogram in the lecture, you have the height here, that's the distance that's given along the here along it's it's along the y-axis. You can also you could also turn this dendrogram in a description in a horizontal form. Let's just have a look into the function. And we see here the individual sides, how they are related to each other, and you would also see the the steps that at, at which step which objects are merged into a cluster. So first side 2 and 11 are merged into one cluster. We can derive from that that these are the most similar sites in the data sets, side data set in terms of species composition. And we see that this actually is the same for the average linkage method and for Ward, for the Ward method. And we see that overall we also come up with two clusters um, that are relatively well separated. So nevertheless, 2 and 11 seem to be quite different to the sides 6, 8 and 7, when the same holds on the, on the left side of the panel. We see here the sides 2, 4 seem to be quite different from the other four sides. Now, how many groups do we have? We will discuss that later on, but you see here that you could cut the clustering at different points. You could cut it here, then you have two groups. You could make a cut here, then you had four groups. You could make a cut here, then you had actually a couple of, of sites in singular clusters and single clusters and so on. So it's not straightforward how many groups you have, but the visual representation of the data may guide you in evaluating how much classes you want to have. Remember, it's an exploratory, ex, exploratory method. Um, yeah. So we will use first and we will, let's say we had a look at this and thought, well, two to four classes may be appropriate and we want to calculate cluster validity indices for that. We do this uh, first, before we do this, we visualize the groups in the 
in the clusters how this would look like. So we plot here the cluster again, annotated true means that we indicate the sites. And then with rect.hclast and then providing the data set and k, k as you may know from the lecture, k always defines the number of clusters. Here we can indicate in the plot where the plot would be cut, where the data would be cut to define groups. So we see here for k equals 2, the two blue squares indicate the two resulting groups with k equals 3. You had the green groups indicated, so that would be one group, that would be one group 6 and 8, and 7, 10, 11 would be one group, and with yellow indicating four groups, this would be the groups 2 and 4, 4, 9, 1, 3, 6, 8, 7, 10, 11. And the resulting partitioning is called the clustering. So what you obtain from the clustering is a vector that assigns the group number or the cluster number to each of the sites and that can later be used in evaluating the clustering. So to do this, we to obtain this vector, we cut, we use the cut tree function, cut tree function, and where it should be how many resulting groups you want to have, how many clusters. And when you cut this, the object that you obtain, just let's have, let's have a quick look, is just a vector that assigns a cluster number to each of the to each of the sides, to each of the objects in the data sets. We could now use this vector and plot the data again and assign the cluster number. We can do this for two and four clusters. So that's pretty easy. And just a final way to visualize or a final method of visualization is to use the NMDS that we've discussed in the previous part of the course. So we don't define, we, we just use the the function wrapper, we've discussed this method that this contains a lot of sub-methods that are used and Bray Curtis, we in the, use the distance metric directly in the function and what we can, what we see here is that we have a relatively low stress value, so 0 0.0, 0 0.05, that means we obtain a very good representation of the data. And we can now plot the data for the two clusters. So if you look in to the code, we first create the plot with type equal n. That means that we don't want to, or we just do this again, that we don't plot. So we don't plot anything initially. Then we plot the points. So that's happening here. And with the function or the spider, you provide the data set, you provide the factor, the factor, a factor level that is used to assign different groups. So cut2 is just a numeric vector. We need to convert that to a factor. When you do this, it creates this kind of spider. So it connects all points to the center of the data, to the grouping here and or the hull creates the hull around the individual clusters. So that's displayed here. So that looks right, quite nice and gives you an indication. We can, we could also do this with four groups. So the code remains the same. We just use the grouping vector for the for, from from the h for the cut tree function uh, with four groups. And then we obtain something like that. So note that visually all the, the point positions haven't changed, but just displaying is it in a different way, you see that it would also fit. Although, I mean, talking of groups of just two points seems for this, uh, 
small amount of samples, perhaps not appropriate. Now we calculate some internal validation indices. We need to do this with the that they are provided in the in the library FPC. The function is called cluster.stats, and this function uh, this function actually calculates a whole range of internal and external validation indices. And we, but I don't want to go into details of each in, into each of the several indices that are computed. Theoretically, you could also use something that is called a voting scheme, where you add up the where you try to integrate the different indices by, for example, if if ten each each of the index votes or the result of that what is an optimal number is a vote for a certain grouping structure and then you will calculate how many indices re resulted or voted for a certain number of groups and take the maximum of this vote or something like that. But have a look into the literature. That's beyond the scope of our course but could be done with this method. So we calculate the indices for two, three, and four groups. Read this text here. There's also the cluster sim package where you can provide different clustering methods and different groups and all is calculated automatically. And we quickly have a look at the different at the results. That, uh, what the object contains. So it contains a lot of information about median distance separation, the average between distance, average within sum of squares, maximum diameter, and so on. We have the silhouette width that we've discussed before. If you set options to true, it would also calculate some different indices and so on. There are many different indices computed here. We we restrict our focus on the Kalinsky and Harabash index that we have discussed in lectures, so I don't go into details here. Just keep in mind that this index is based on sum of squares, and the higher this index is, the better. So here we see that we obtain the highest result for two groups, so we would evaluate that two groups are the best solution for this data set. Now we calculate or we, we extract from the object the average silhouette width. So remember in the lecture we also discussed that the highest silhouette, average silhouette width is the best, or would be the, would be the maximum silhouette width indicates the best number of groups, the optimal number of groups. That would be again two groups here in this case. Also remember that we had some kind of rule of thumb to evaluate the absolute values of the silhouette width and it would be for 0 0.2 you have no cluster structure and 0 0.5 means you would have a reasonable cluster structure. You can also calculate the individual silhouette values and remember that this gives you the average, average distances within the cluster of, a, of, a, of an individual observation and to the nearest neighboring cluster and negative values indicate that the, that the observation might be played a better place in another cluster. cluster. The silhouette function you just provide you just provide here the resulting clustering and the distance matrix and then you obtain the results for each individual object, object. And we see that actually one of the sites is supposed to be placed or according to this index has been placed in a wrong cluster. So the silhouette width is minus 0.12. So observation 8 might better be placed in another cluster. We can also plot the silhouette width so it shows us the values and the values for each site here in a graphical display. This is cluster 1, this is cluster 2, and these are the average silhouette width. So according to this plot, we might better place 
this observation the side 8 into cluster 1. And finally we calculate the gap index. Remember that this compares our data to a reference distribution or from the same data. Now remember as so the gap the, the, the cluster gap function is initially tailored for k-means clustering but we can make it work which with um, hierarchical agglomerative clustering but we need to define a function before which then this is done here h class cut function which in the end runs the hierarchical agglomerative clustering and directly cuts the cluster the, the dendrogram at a certain point to, to that will result in the desired number of clusters. So we don't need to explain that here in detail. Have a look into the individual clusters that are nested here within. It looks a little bit complicated. That's just a helper function so that we are able to calculate the gap for hierarchical agglomerative clustering. Now let's look here. The cluster gap function you provide the data, you provide the function that calculates the cluster, the clustering, then you provide the, num the maximum number of groups, so it will run from all the groups from 1 to 5, and you provide the space from which the data is taken for the reference distribution, so we take here the original space for the null hypothesis. So what do we obtain? We see that there's bootstrapping done on the original data for five data sets and we obtain then we have we see here we or we see here that um, it also gives us this uh, a judgment on whether we or which would be the number of clusters that results in the largest gap and that's actually done here based on the first sum or, or difference in the standard error that yields the maximum difference. So it's not the absolute maximum, but it's the observed, but it's the, the difference between the reference and our data that um, falls within one standard error. So we can also modify this standard error could choose also just using the maximum gap value. If we look at the gap values, we see here that indeed the gap value is lowest for, uh, for uh, is, is highest for cluster 4. In fact, in all other cases, our clustering result is worse than that from a randomly drawn reference distribution so you could evaluate that the clustering is not particularly good for this specific data set so so we decide we should decide here on four groups based on this index we can also calculate the stability that's done with the cluster boot function the cluster boot function takes again as Input here, if you have the distances calculated already, you, you provide the distance matrix, you set distances to true. You have different clustering methods that are used for which you evaluate the stability. Have a look into the help for this function. You see that it, it's very versatile. It allows you to define many different methods from k-means to different hierarchical agglomerative clustering methods and here the clustering method the average linkage clustering and we calculate the stability for two and four groups so it takes bootstrap samples and we print the results we see that here the cluster-wide jacquard bootstrap results in a mean jacquard index so it always compares the bootstrapped the bootstrapped data to the original data in a pairwise manner and calculates the jacquard index so how much we have how good is the match between the different data sets 
Uh, we see that the average match in terms of the Jakar index is very high. We have a mean of 0.9 and 0.87. The solve means how many times our, our Jakar index for pairwise means fell below 0.5. And how often it was uh, recovered means how often was above 0.75. So you can set these thresholds according to your objectives as well. So we can plot the results, the distribution of the pairwise Jakar similarity for the different bootstrap samples, and yeah, have a look. Um, if we look at the stability for four clusters, we see that most of the stability values, the mean Jakar values, are below the values for, for two groups. So two groups seem more stable than the solution with four groups. Overall, you see that depending on the index and on your aim two or four groups could be justified based on these indices. We finally calculate an external validation index, that's the RAND index here. So the RAND index is uh, calculated also with the cluster stats function. Um, the cluster stats function we have used already. The changes here that beside the clustering, besides our initial clustering, we provide as alt.clustering a numeric vector of the, yeah, of the grouping structure that is used for external validation. So that is used as so-called ground truth. Remember, if we look into this, this is, a, this is a factor with downstream and upstream, and we need a numeric vector. So by using the function as numeric, on this, we have the result that we have uh, twos and ones as integers in this um, vector. So we can calculate calculate the cluster stats again. So we would obtain all internal cluster indices as well. And then we extract the RAND index and we see it's 0.63. So that's reasonably high. Um, keep in mind that that's also similar to the Jakar index that has been to the simple matching coefficient um, as well. Uh, have a look into the have a look into the lecture how this is calculated. Note actually that if we would look into the data, you would see that we all only have one of the objects misclassified. So you see here that misclassification of just one of the points results in a reduction, a quite some reduction in the adjusted RAND index. You will later on see that for a data set with much larger sample size that this reduction is much smaller. And we can compute this RAND index as well for four groups and we see that's actually much lower. That's not surprisingly because we have external data with two groups. Now if we have uh, found four groups then it is obviously a worse fit. Now a different way of comparison with external data is to just visualize this and as you remember we just used NMDS for visualization and that's what we will do as well. We select colors here for the external data so dark red and steel blue are assigned we will later assign to the upstream and downstream position and then we open a new graphics window that's x11 on Windows and we plot again, that's the same, that's more or less the same um, code as above. The only difference is that we have the color command here. And the colors are given by the Vera position vector. So remember, that's a factor. So 
we say that the positions of this color vector are, are selected based on the factor that is provided in the vera position vector. So how does it look? How does this look like when we plot this? We now see we have blue dots and red dots. The blue dots are related to the upstream sides and the, no, the, the blue dots are related to the downstream sides and the others to the red to the upstream sides. Or maybe conversely you now. Red is downstream, blue is upstream sides. Now we add our, so this is the external data. So this shows you to which position along the river gradient the sample belongs to. Now the clustering now, this is the original data as well, the clustering now assigned these different points to clusters and we plot the hull and the spider as above. And you can see here visually that this red point here is certainly misclassified and that's the point that we have already well, misclassified according to the external data so we might evaluate that this that this uh, point should belong to the second cluster based on the external data they turn into the external data that's a downstream side but it's characterized as upstream so this also teaches us somehow that we can't 100% rely on the external data because the so-called ground truth is the ground truth with respect to the geographic position here. But is it necessarily the ground truth regarding the ecological groups that we find in the rivers? Apparently not, obviously not. So we have certainly the putting or or um, assigning this observation, this species composition to group, to the group, to the first group here makes more sense and the ecological interpretation or explanation may be straightforward. We, it's most likely the case that in this, although it's a downstream position, in this position the effect of the discharge has not hit yet. So here you have a, an extra session that shows you one issue it, uh, and this is in some textbooks you read that you can do a cluster analysis and later on check the results via ANOVA and this should not be done. And this warning example shows you that just using random data, putting this into a cluster algorithm, you will find some grouping structure that is statistically significant, although that makes no sense. I'm not executing that, that's rather an extra session for those that are interested, so have a look in case you're interested in that. And then you have the exercise here, where you should compute, uh, we should, you should run for a new data set, the complete single and average linkage hierarchical clustering analysis and a couple of other things that are described here in the text so have a look you will find the solution to this answer to this exercises as well uh, provided on the website in a few weeks now we have discussed extensively the hierarchical agglomerative clustering we have to, we know that in the lecture there's also non-hierarchical clustering and k-means is one of the widespread clustering techniques in use for non-hierarchical clustering and we illustrate here how you can use k-means for clustering. Remember that for k-means as well we don't know what is, the, what is the number of groups and we need to provide the group number of groups before so that's something that we didn't need to do for the hierarchical agglomerative clustering. Looking at the data set that we load here, the class data, you see that we have here, this is actually the, class, the, the data set, are class vessels that have been found in different locations and there have been the, the, the iron contents, different uh, 
different minerals have been measured in these classes. So we scale the data before, we can already see that, for example, silicium dioxide has uh, much higher values and concentrations than SO3 or chloride. So we scale the data to have the same mean and variance. And for the k-means, the function is just called k-means. You provide the, the, the data, so here the scaled class data set. You tell the function how many groups you want to build. So that's the k that's provided as centers here. And then you have the number of starts. So re remember that the k-means starts the algorithm with a random assignment of groups and then moves points between groups and checks whether this improves a quality criteria, which in the k means is the based on the Euclidean distance is the sum of square, and why this yields to a result. Now, sometimes with you, the, the, the results can be sensitive to the initial distribution or assignment of points, and that's why we do several starts. So we run this function. And we display this function later on. This has been done before, so we calculate the Euclidean distance. We calculate the NMDS. And we display the result. So that's something we would call external validation. You, we display the result against the in an, in an NMDS here. So we choose different colors. So again, we first use or plot without, then we select some colors that we want to plot, and we plot here then the points of the of the different clusters. So remember we have created four clusters here. Again, this looks like that, this one. Yeah, interestingly, this point looks clearly ill assigned. There seems to be an error here. You could theoretically, after you extracted the partitioning, you could theoretically see which point that is and assign this point to cluster three, for example. Apart from that, the clusters look reasonably separated, although we could argue that three and four could be merged into one cluster. So running again with three clusters may... So you see here they are actually overlapping because of this point. Uh, the hull is overlapping. We can now calculate internal validation indices. We've done this above. so. You have to adjust some of the some of the functions that we used above for the calculation of internal indices, depending on which function it is, and and provide the function the information that we use here, k-means, and not hierarchical clustering. One function that has been created specifically for for the clustering of different groups is the cascade km and cascade km allows for the given data set to calculate the Kalinsky criterion you could also select another criterion but the Kalinsky criterion for two up to ten groups so we do this and then we can actually plot this and what you see here on the left side is it's the object, where the objects, and you see here the, the groups, the groups in each partition. You see here the number of colors tells you how many groups are assigned or where to which to which group an object is assigned. So you have here object one, for example, belongs to group one. We have just two groups in the beginning, 
1 and group 2, then 3 groups are built and you can see which of the objects are belonging to the individual groups. So you go from bottom to top and you can read like a barcode almost. You can read here for one line, always you choose 6 or 7 or 8, so it's obviously discrete assignment. So you can read to which object, to which cluster one object would belong to and how many clusters you would have how the data is distributed. Here you see the number of clusters against the Kalinsky criterion and you see the values for this criterion and that's highest for two groups. So it would suggest that we have two groups here. You can extract the partitioning into the different clusters or so the vector that assigns objects to a cluster with, with the wire, the partition slot. So partition one is the partition for two clusters. If you would use this function you had, you had uh, partitioning for three clusters and the call names that would give you the confirmation that if you select the first column here, or the first element of the vector of partition, the first name would be two groups. So based on this, we expect you to compare the solutions of two and four groups with two other CVIs that you can choose. Use the clustering, use the clustering, so the partitioning as input for these CVIs and visualize for two and four groups the, the clustering. Which solution would you such a regard as the most appropriate? So that's it. I hope you learned something from this video and that it's useful for your further work.